This is Women's History Month. And so the museum asked me to um, do a talk on some women. And of course, you know, last year we spent the whole time um, talking about women's suffrage and that seemed like a, a natural thing. But the thing is I'm kind of women's suffraged out. So I thought I'd fall back on something that I have not really spent a lot of time with recently, and that's the history of Morrison Reeves. And um, Morrison Reeves Library naturally has a lot of female members of its, of its history. And so that's, that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Okay, so the four women that we're gonna talk about tonight are, are these four. And it's um, three of them are librarians. And the fourth is the woman who turned the Morrison Library into the Morrison Reeves Library. Um, so they are, as you, let me see, let me get this. Yeah, that's not going to work. Anyway, this is, um, this is Sarah Wrigley, and she was the first librarian. She served from, I'm sorry, 1864 until 1903. Um, and I should say, for those of you who don't know, the, the interesting thing about Morrison Reeves is the first three librarians between them served 120 years, which is just, just amazing. So Sarah Wrigley and then Ada Bernhardt, who is the third person there, she served from 1903 until 1945. And then um, Harriet Bard, who I'm afraid is, is cut off in this picture, is um, the, the third librarian who served from 1945 until 1985. And then this one, this woman right here is Caroline Middleton Reeves. And she is the woman who donated a large sum of money to turn the old library, the, the Morrison Library into the Morrison Reeves. And, and we'll, we'll talk about all that in a second. Um, so we're going to just start in with uh, with Sarah Wrigley. Not working well. Okay. So John Finley was a very early prominent member. He was a member of, of Richmond's history. He came from R Virginia very early on, about 1820, and he was a a legislator. He spent some time in the Indiana legislature very early on. In the 1830s, he spent most of his time as the uh, clerk of courts, which for the, the Wayne County Court, which at that point was in Centerville. So that for a time they lived in Centerville. Um, in 1852, he was elected Richmond's second mayor and he kept getting reelected until he died in 1866. And in addition to all of the, the legislative, the, the, the governmental things, he was a newspaper publisher for a time. He was the publisher of the Richmond Palladium. He was also a poet and he published several works of poetry. But the interesting thing is he's sort of credited with the first um, literary use of the word Hoosier. His poem called The Hoosier's Nest was published 1831 or 1833, I'm, I'm not sure which. And it was kind of like the first time, obviously the word Hoosier was in use before then, but this was the first time it was sort of put into some sort of a, a popular form. So his daughter then, Sarah, was for a young lady on the frontier, which is what... Um, Indiana was in the 1830s, um, was a very well-educated young woman. This is a, a picture of her as a young woman. Could you shut that door, Martha? Um, so the thing is, we don't know an awful lot about her until the 1850s when she got married. So there was a young man named Benjamin Wrigley. He was born in Boston well, in, in Massachusetts. And his whole family emigrated to Texas sometime, I'm not sure exactly when. But by 1850, he is listed as being a student at Oberlin 
College, I'm sorry, Oberlin College in Ohio. So he graduated as a lawyer. And then at some point soon thereafter, he made it over to um, Richmond. So September of 1854, Benjamin Wrigley and Sarah Wrigley were married. Now it's very likely that it was a shotgun wedding because the first child was born, well, it was, it was Roy Wrigley. We don't have exact um, birth records for him, but years later, he, um, when he applied for a passport, he recorded that he was born in March of 1855. So if that's true, then, you know, you know, do the math. Now, the thing was right after the wedding in September, we do, I do have the, um, the, the marriage certificate or a copy of it. So I know they were married in 18, September of 1854. They almost immediately um, left and moved to Newcastle where uh, Benjamin took up a, a position at the Newcastle Courier. So I'm speculating that again, shotgun wedding, he had to get, you know, the, the father had to get the, the happy couple out of town. And so, you know, John Finley was a, a newspaper man and so probably pulled some strings to get him with an, another newspaper over in Henry County. The next year, there was another child named Luke. And soon thereafter, they actually did come back to Richmond. Let's see. And Benjamin Wrigley then put up a shingle and started practicing law, which obviously is what he wanted to do from the start anyway. So he's there in November of 1856. And he was there for the next, you know, six or eight months, as far as I can tell. And then he just disappears. He winds up in Kansas. And eventually he winds up on the constitutional convention for the state of Kansas. So he pretty much, he's done with Richmond. He never returns. So basically Sarah is, you know, she's a single mother um, with two young boys. At first though, she's just abandoned, but after the start of the civil war, Benjamin, migrated back down to Texas where his family resided. And in December of 1861, he was thrown from a horse and killed pretty much instantly. Um, so she is indeed now a widow. So the, um, the Civil War has started and like all young ladies and well, all ladies in throughout the, the North, Sarah starts um, working toward helping the union cause. And that pretty much meant um, the ladies aid circle, at least in this case. Um, organizations were formed all over the North. Um, a lot of them eventually wound up being aligned with the sanitary commission. That was a national organization. The, the state of Indiana had a, a sanitary commission. And then all of these um, groups, local groups raised money, they collected, uh, you know, material for bandages, food, medicines to send to Union hospitals. And initially, some of them also worked to um, take care of the families of the soldiers that, that had gone off to fight. And so, so Sarah is actually winds up being the secretary of the local organization. It was, sometimes it was called the Ladies' Aid Circle, the Soldiers' Relief Circle. They had a, they, the names kind of were a little fluid, I think, back then. But anyway, um, so she kept herself busy working for the union. Then we can talk about then her her brother, her only brother, John Finley. He joined up, joined the military um, weeks after Fort Sumter. He was first in the, the 16th Indiana, which was a one of the, the short-term uh, regiments. Eventually he wound up in the 69th 
uh, Indiana Volunteer Regiment. And that was mostly men from Wayne County. He was, he started off as a second lieutenant. By the time of Vicksburg, he was a captain and he was badly wounded in May of 1863. Uh, the initial reports back from, uh, from Vicksburg said that he was mortally wounded, but he recovered. And right about this time, uh, you know, it was, it was a siege at Vicksburg. And so there were lots and lots of casualties, more than usual, but General Grant didn't have the resources to properly care for all of the casualties that he had. And Governor Morton, who was from Centerville originally, was, you know, they, they called him the soldier's friend. And so he arranged for steamships to be fitted out with, um, with supplies, with doctors and nurses, and sent to Vicksburg specifically to care for Union soldiers that were sick and wounded. Now I know for actually when I was doing uh, research last year from Dr. Mary Thomas, there were at least two or three and probably more different steamships that were sent from Evansville down to Vicksburg. And once they got word that, that John was not dead and he was making a recovery, Sarah was able to get herself onto one of those steamships. Now, I'm, I'm sure that it was through the influence of, of Governor Morton because I know that, you know, when John Finley was the clerk of courts, I know he was acquainted with, with Morton because they were both there at the same time. So I'm sure he was able to pull strings that way to get his daughter onto one of these boats. And it was for the purpose of bringing his son home. And so that is what, um, that's what Sarah did. She got on this boat and went down to Vicks Vicksburg and she did care for her brother on the way back. And I think there was another, one other officer that was in her care. Um, this little clipping right here is from, this is actually from one of the ones that, um, that Mary Thomas was on, but you can see the Indiana State Sanitary Boat. I mean, they, they sent, this particular one is, uh, this, it was called the Sunnyside and left Evansville on the 16th of June. So, oh, I'm sorry, it was probably 16th of July. I'm sorry. Anyway, so she was able to bring his, um, bring her brother back home to Richmond and he was convalescing here and he was he was getting better by all reports he was improving and was gonna he was hoping to, to return return to his regiment but in August um, probably a, an infection of some sort took his life so he did not survive he died and Sarah Wrigley wrote later that that blow is something that his, her father never recovered from. So the next year then, Robert Morrison, our buddy, Robert Morrison, um, I'm not gonna talk too much about him because he's not a, a woman, <laughs> but, Robert Morrison took it upon himself to build a library and stock it with books. This image right here is what the Morrison Library looked like soon after it opened in the summer of 1864. And Sarah was one of the people who helped setting it up. She actually was one of the ones who applied for the position of librarian. And initially she did not get it. Um, a man named Jesse Brown officially was the first librarian, but we don't count him because as I said before, she was there for 39 years. A couple of weeks after he started, after it opened, he was offered the superintendency of the city schools. And so he took that and so he was only the librarian for a couple of weeks. And so 
in September of 1864, Sarah Wrigley became the librarian of the Morrison Library. Now, it's at the start, there really wasn't a whole lot going on because the library itself was really just one room. Now, it was a very large room with a balcony, but it was this north part of the building and it was just a room full of books. The library was only open a few hours a day and not every day. And so she could be the only librarian. Um, it's it's kind of difficult to think of now, but the again, it was just a repository for books. It's just where you kept the books. People, when they wanted a book, what they were supposed to do is purchase a catalog. And I, I don't have one with me, but it was literally a printed book that listed all of the books that, that were on the shelves, at least at a, some point in time. And everyone was supposed to purchase their own copy of this book, take it home, and then make their selection of what they wanted to read next from this printed catalog. And then write down all the information just as it is in the catalog, because everything is arranged by, by accession number. And so the location of every book is just, you know, shelf number five, you know, num whatever. It was very, it was not by subject at all. Anyway, um, so yes, you would write everything down and take it to the librarian and she would literally unlock the glass door, get your book and give it to you. And then you were supposed to go home. It really, there wasn't any place to sit. You weren't supposed to, to hang out at the library. It was just some place where you went to get the book and you took it home. So for many years, that's really, there wasn't a whole lot of, of change. Um, there was in the 1870s, they started, they were able to, to start levying a tax. Um, there was a small addition added to it in the 1880s. But at this point, we need to start talking about the next person in our little group here. This is Mark Reeves and his brother, James Reeves. So we have to kind of go back in time a little bit here. Mark Reeves arrived in Richmond from New Jersey around 1823, when Mark was only 12 years old. The father was a carpenter by trade, but he was not very well, I guess. And so the, the kids, the, the youngsters here had to start working pretty early on. So Mark and James both wound up working in, in various stores in town. Ulti well, not ultimately, but after a while, Mark actually worked for Robert Morrison in one of his stores, the store in Washington, Indiana. Now Washington, Indiana back then is what we call Greens Fork today. So what I've got here is a quick little, keep going the wrong way. Um, this is just a quick little um, snippet from the Palladium. It was something that they kind of had almost every day. It was the list of agents, anybody who was authorized to sell the Palladium in all of these outlying areas. And so you've got Centerville, and of course it's, it's the earlier spelling of Centerville. And then Washington. Washington, again, is, is what we call Greens Fork today. And then you got economy and Newport, of course, is now Fountain City. And that's only a handful of the thing. I just put that, that image in there just to show you that Mark Reeves was in Greens Fork in, 19, in 1835. In the mid-1840s then, both of the brothers then headed to Cincinnati and started a wholesale boot and shoe store. Uh, they were pretty successful, but James, after a couple of years, James, his health started failing. So he sold out and he moved back to Richmond. But Mark stayed in Cincinnati until after the Civil War. Um, let's see, he's also, Got a couple of other, these are from envelopes from that period. So you can see he was, you know, he had his own stationery made. Um, 
Mark did have a first wife named um, Julietta, but she died of consumption fairly young. And in 1849, he must have still had family and friends in New Jersey because um, he married Caroline Middleton, who at that point lived in Crosswicks, New Jersey. So that was 1849. They lived in Cincinnati. But during the Civil War, he sent his family home to Richmond, presumably because it was a little further out of harm's way. I mean, Cincinnati was, you know, threatened a couple of times with, uh, with some, you know, Confederate armies. So the couple then had, had two children, one of whom was, this is, this is Mary Taylor Reeves and her husband, William Dudley Folk. Uh, both of these two are, are also very important in the history of Morrison Reeves, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, they also had a son, Arthur Middleton Reeves, and Arthur was a scholar. He was a businessman. He graduated from Cornell. He also, he had a, a printing business in town in, in Richmond for a while, um, but his first love was Iceland. He, being pretty wealthy, he was able to um, travel, travel the world, and he was able to travel to Iceland on numerous occasions. And so his first book, the title was The Finding of Wineland the Good, which is just a horrible title, but um, his, his thesis was that based on his translations of the old Norse sagas, that the Vikings were the first Europeans to reach the New World you know, before Columbus, which today is fairly common knowledge, but in 1890, I guess it was still being discussed. And so, so yes, so that was that was his his first love was was Iceland. All right. So after the Civil War, then Mark Reeves retired from business. He was he was very wealthy, and it was right about this time then that he also um, he came back to Richmond. He was he was one of the wealthiest men in the whole county, by several accounts. This is a, a bit of a map from the 1874 Atlas. And so you can see, you know, this is Richmond. This is the, the east side of town, the, um, the Hawkins. This is what the area that, that's now Glen Miller and, you know, Main Street. But right here, this is the farm. They called it a farm of Mark E. Reeves. This was his his land. Now you may sort of notice that today we call this area Reeveston because after he died and then, you know, after Caroline died in 1911, the area was sold to developers and it was then, it wasn't until the 1920s that it started really being developed as a residential area. But in the 19th century, this area belonged to, to Mark Reeves and his family. So they were, again, as I said, very, very wealthy, very well-to-do, very influential. This is a picture of the Cycle Club. Now the Cycle Club was pretty much, I, as far as I know, it was the first women's club. It was limited to a certain number of women it was called the cycle club because they didn't have a certain place to meet. They cycled through everybody's house. So they took turns hosting the meetings. And so right here then we have, this is Caroline Reeves herself and lots of other big names. I think that's Mrs. Benjamin Starr. Actually this one right here, that is Mary Taylor Reeves folk. So Caroline's daughter. And this over here, this is Mrs. Um, uh, 
Emily Stubbs, the wife of Lewis Stubbs, sorry, lost his name there. Um, but these are all the, the, the high society of Richmond in the 1880s. So unfortunately though, in 1883, Mark Reeves died of cancer. And in 1891, Arthur was killed in a train wreck near Hagerstown. And this is actually a, a, an image of that train wreck. And I'm not gonna go into it now, but this one, one of those ones where, you know, the, the newspapers back then were all about the gore. And so very graphic descriptions of, of what took place. So another time. So this was uh, 1891. June of 1892, Caroline Reeves and her son-in-law, and also who was also um, acting as her lawyer, William Dudley Falk, came to a, a meeting of the board of the Morrison Library. At that point, Judge Comstock, D.W. Comstock, was the president of the board. And she had a proposal that she wanted to present to the board. And she proposed that she wanted to give $30,000 to the Morrison Library. But she had, there were some strings attached. Okay, so the, the terms that she had were that to add the name Reeves to the name of the library, and that's fairly straightforward. Nobody had a big problem with that. The, um, she wanted to create this separate Reeves committee and that committee, it was going to be three people to, they were going to administer the, um, the money that was left over from, okay, it was $30,000 and it was going to go to the construction of this, um, new library, but what, whatever was left over was going to be held in trust. And so this committee was going to be the ones who would handle that, that trust. And then the third, uh, the, the third, you know, string, I keep saying, is the one that really caused trouble. What she wanted, she wanted to make sure that the Reeves committee would also have a say in the selection of a new librarian. And at this point, um, uh, Judge Comstock had a problem with it. Um, the, they first met in June of 1892. They didn't meet again until December of 1892. And it was all to, to try to work out how we were gonna do this because Judge Comstock was fairly adamant that those terms would not be conducive to the will of Robert Morrison that Robert Morrison had laid out that it, that his library was going to be under control of the Morrison Library Committee. They called him a, the committee at that point. It's the board. So the Morrison Library Board would be in charge of running the library. And he objected to the fact that these other people wanted to come in and have a say in a new librarian. So ultimately, he resigned from the board and was replaced by another lawyer, um, James Birch, uh, Charles Birchenall. And ultimately it was agreed to, it actually had to go, they filed in a, in a circuit court and, but anyway, the way was cleared for this new construction. And so, but that third, string is going to come back later and I'll get we'll get to that in a sec. All right, so we've got the old the first library on the the left there and the new library on the right. Now, when I first, you know, years ago when I first started looking at this, I thought, well, you know, they knocked down that first one and built the second one and that's absolutely not what happened. This is an addition. So it's actually Fairly, it's uh, what I've got here is um, the Sanborn maps. 
Mm. So we're kind of lucky because in this case, both of those, you know, the corner of, of North A and six were at the top corner. That's okay, I got him. Sorry, I, we're, not, we're not with it tonight. Go ahead and sit down. This is Clarence, sorry. He wants to be part of it. Every Zoom meeting is supposed to have a cat though, right? Anyway. Okay, so the public library here, 1891, the library, as I said before, the, the first library was just a, 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 a square basically. Now, as I said, it was, it was added to a couple of times. So in 1891, this is what it looked like. And, and I can't see it on mine because this, this panel is in the way. Let me see, maybe, I don't know what I'm doing to the rest of yours, but this is what the Sanborn map for the finished um, library looked like. So um, you can see underneath all this is the same shape of the 1891 version. So what they did is they knocked out this, well, they didn't knock it out, but they added to it. They, they expanded down into the next lot. And this is where the stacks were, three levels of stacks. Um, they added, you know, some more, stonework here towards the front so it was closer to the street and of course the very distinctive um, tower. Also this is where the um, they built the two-story uh, uh, bay window which is where the um, the Tiffany window was placed. Also you can see on this um, on the, the the Sanborn map the the pink denotes brick and so you can see this has actually got a little bit, it, it, well, it's, it's kind of a bluish, but that shows that this is all covered in stone, limestone. So you can see, man, yeah, there you go. This is all the, the stone as opposed to the brick. So this is what, you know, most people who remember the old library, this is what they remember. All right. And I just threw this in because it's a really very cool photo. This is, act it's not the greatest photo, but it's um, taken from the um, 1893 County Atlas. They had a bunch of pictures towards the end and this was one of them. So very cool. This is actually, it, what's supposed to be here is a picture of what was called the boys and girls room. One of the things that Mrs. Wrigley had always wanted to do was to have a special place where children could read books. But if the library is just one room, you really can't do that. So after the big renovation, when there was more room, and actually that was the other thing that was added was a whole nother floor. Um, there was, the, you know, on the third, third floor, they added, it, uh, fitted out a room with, you can't really see it, but, um, you know, shorter books, uh, or, I'm sorry, shorter sh bookshelves and some tables where, where the kids could, could read books. Something she'd always wanted to do and it wasn't until 1900 that she was able to do that and only because there was that expansion of the, of the building. So then soon after 1900, Mrs. Wrigley was not a young woman anymore. And so we need to start talking about the Stubbs. Now I mentioned Lewis Stubbs before, this is his picture. Um, lawyer, judge, very prominent man in, in Wayne County. And he was one of the first three members of that Reeves committee that I talked about. And it was, I mean, the three members of that committee were Caroline Reeves, William Dudley Folk and Lewis Stubbs. This is his wife, Emily Stubbs. She was very artistic. She did a lot of China painting, uh, which I guess was a big thing back in the 19th century. They had two daughters. This right here is Edna. She married a, uh, an Episcopal minister named Cathel. So this is Edna Cathel, best known as the woman who painted the patent applications for Hills Roses. You know, back before there was, you know, much in the way of color photography, if, you know, Mr. Hill was going to get a patent for his latest rose, 
he had to have some represent representation of the color of the rose. And at that point, he would get Edna Cathell to paint his roses. And so that she's, she certainly did lots of other things, but she's kind of best known for painting the Hills roses. Then their other daughter then was Ada Luella Stubbs, and she married William Bernhardt. Now, as far as I know, Ada was never artistic, visually artistic, but she was very literary, very, um, well, she, well, I'll get to that in a sec. So she, um, she actually was one of the first female, not the first, but an early female graduate of Earlham College. She, um, again, was, was very, very literary. Her husband was a lawyer, William Bernhardt. They married in 1884, had a son. And then I'm not sure what happened. He was either injured or he was ill and he wasn't able to perform all of his duties. But for a time, he was actually um, employed by William Dudley Falk as a literary secretary. He helped with um, his research or so one, one of the sources said. Unfortunately, whatever it was that made him ill also made him very despondent. And in 1888, he purchased a gun, got on a train to Indianapolis, and committed suicide, leaving a young wife and child. Um, so the source that I found said that Ada took over her husband's job. So she also then worked for William Dudley Falk as a literary secretary. I know she was a notary at times. She was, you know, did lots, but yeah, she had to support herself. Um, so, so this is where that, that third string sort of comes in. So this is that cycle club picture again. And here's, um, Caroline Reeves and her daughter, Mary. This is the, the same one that I had on, on the previous slide. This is uh, Louis Stubbs' wife, her mother. And this actually, this is the earliest known picture of Ada Bernhardt. So she's right there in among the high society, you know, high literary bunch. In 1903, Mrs. Wrigley finally was just had to retire. She'd been ill for very long and she did retire. And everybody thought that a woman named Florence Robbins would just take over. Florence Robbins had been working at Morrison Reeves for 17 years. And the previous seven months, she had essentially been the librarian because Mrs. Wrigley had been ill so much. So at first, everybody just assumed that Florence Robbins would just step into the role as head librarian. But here's where that, you know, it says here, joint boards. This is where both committees met in order to choose a new librarian. And of course, here comes Ada Bernhardt because she's Lewis Stubbs' daughter she is just super, super connected to everybody on the Reeves side of things and the folk side of things. So Ada Bernhardt steps in to become the Morrison Reeves, second Morrison Reeves librarian. And then not too surprising, Florence Robbins pretty much the next day says, that's it, I'm out of here. And she moved to Chicago to live with her sister. Can't blame her. So Ada Bernhardt, the thing about Ada Bernhardt is that she was one of those 19th century, and, and this is exactly the way um, William Dudley Folk believed as well, okay? If any of you have been to the library and you've seen that, that awful sonnet that is cast in bronze back near our um, upper level elevator, uh, you know, the, the Victorian idea of a library, a library is to provide 
Shakespeare and Milton. You know, why would you want to read anything but Shakespeare and Milton? You don't want to read any of that new stuff, any new fiction. You know, in fact, for a lot of years, the the circulation um, circulation numbers were were split between fiction and nonfiction. Fiction was just like a, a low, you know, a low end sort of a thing. You, you know, nobody, nice people didn't read fiction unless it was, you know, high literature. But this is this is what she was coming from. And again, from the artistic standpoint, very heavy. The, the, the collection that she created was very heavy on art, all kinds of art reference books. The Commercial Club, which is sort of a pre-Chamber of Commerce, in 1914, I'm not sure exactly why, I think they, they claimed that the library wasn't popular enough and they actually hired a consultant to come in and sort of look at the problem. One of the things that this consultant determined is that they're literally, I mean, the, the headline says too many art books. There's nothing in there for people who want to learn how to lear learn a trade or for you know, for pleasure. I mean, you know, it was all a very high end collection. And so she did take to heart some of those things. And actually in, in June of 1914, so in, in February 1914 was when she was criticized for having too much, you know, foreign language and, and art books, lots of that. You know, I mean, she thought that was that was what a library should have. Um, so by June, you know, of course, she had like a, you know, new books at Morrison Reed's uh, column in the paper. And she reports in June that she has added um, light fiction for the benefit of summer readers. So I think she, she was trying. But when you hear the description that... Um, Mary, uh, Harriet Bard had years later, she didn't make a whole lot of progress on that. Um, now, on the other hand, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Bernhardt did lead the, the library through two world wars and the depression, which were certainly challenging. I know I've got, I've got articles where there were book drives during both of the wars where people were encouraged to, um, you know, donate books to send to um, uh, army camps for the, the pleasure of the, of the soldiers. Um, and during the depression, of course, uh, the revenues all, you know, the tax revenues dropped to nothing. We all know about that. And they actually had to start cutting back on hours and this is one of those, those moments where the Reeves Committee actually did, they actually paid extra money. They paid the salaries of everybody over the usual so that they could keep the, the library open the regular hours during the depression, the depths of the depression. That was one of the sort of special projects that the Reeves Committee did work on. Um, but, by 1945, she also, he, she was not young. She had been ill for many months. She was barely in the library for, for a long periods of time. And the board decided that, you know, asked for her resignation. Um, they did have somebody in mind to replace her. And so the next woman that we're going to talk about then is Harriet Bard. And I don't have her picture right here either. It was on that front uh, panel. So Harriet Bard actually was born in New England and married Mr. Bard. I, I think his name was Herbert. He was an educator and he got a job in Connersville. And so that's what got Mrs. Bard with her great, you know, accent, got her from New England to Indiana. And she did divorce him. And so she also is just, just like Mrs. Uh, Bernhardt, she was, you know, a young woman on her own with a son. And she 
wound up being uh, hired by the Hagerstown Library. So for, for, I don't know, five or six years, she was the librarian at Hagerstown. And it didn't take a whole lot for the folks in Richmond to lure her away from Hagerstown to Richmond. Now, I, I do have access to her, well, everybody does, they're on the IU East website, but she did a lengthy uh, oral history with Dr. Blakey back in 1975. And one of the things that she talked about was what, what the library looked like when she took over. And so she talks about how the, the, um, the collection was very heavy on art and philosophy and literature. So even in 1945, at least in Mrs. Bard's um, view, it was still very, very heavy. Um, it was also apparently, according to Mrs. Bard, it was just physically, it was a dark, dreary, place. Um, she said it was not inviting at all. There were the lighting in the place was literally like, you know, bare bulbs, different places. And so, and, and she said at one time she came to Richmond with a friend who was doing some errands and she decided to visit the library. This was before she was the librarian. She walked in and was just looking around and she said she was appalled. And she said appalled. Appalled that nobody greeted her or asked if she needed help or if they could help her with anything. Just She was just kind of ignored. And so that's what she was working on. When she got to become the librarian at Morrison Reeves, the, the word she used was a live collection. She wanted to create a live collection. Not something that was, you know, good for, you know, PhD students, but somebody, something that everybody could use. Now, the thing is, too, she said for the first five years of her tenure, pretty much all she did was try to replace staff because when she, um, um, gosh, Mrs. Mrs. Bernhardt, in 1945, there were basically five full-time staff. One of them was Mrs. Bernhardt, she had retired, and two other people pretty much quit this at the same time. So she was running around trying to find more staff and to just, you know, throw a coat of paint on the whole place. It was just, again, dreary, not appealing, not welcoming at all. And so one of the first things that she did, and it was partially funded by, again, the Reeves Committee, this was a a, a, an unused room on the first floor on the lower level and she created this um well this this was the boys and girls room now at this point it looks like it's pretty i don't want to say empty but it's it definitely was a lot um a lot more uh crowded in later years but this is what it looked like soon after um she was finished with it. This is about 1948 when this picture was taken. And then also she renovated the, the main reading room. So um, I did have some pictures and again, they didn't come through, but the old reading room was, was very dark and, and dreary. And so she you know, threw a good coat of paint on everything and made it a little more welcoming. Now, one of the big things that she wanted, in addition to creating a, a better collection in the building, she wanted to get that collection out to as many people as she could. It's great if they come in to, to, to get stuff, but she wanted to take that, um, the books out to the public. And one of the first things that she was able to do was to create a small library down at the Smith Esteb Hospital. That was a TB hospital down on south on 27, almost to Potter Shop Road. The building is still there. Um, and so she was able to get donations. And because back in the you know early 50s, TB was still not curable and uh, very contagious. And so, you know, she would have to sort of get herself up in this nurse garb and 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 take books down there. And they, they actually, the doctors down there pretty much said, we don't want anybody who has small children to come down here. 
And so it kind of fell to her to be the librarian down at Smith Estes. So she would go down there a couple times a month and, and take, take books around to people. Um, there was a book cart at East Haven. This, uh, this picture I think is from 1952. In uh, 19, the late 1950s, they established a small library at the Boys Club uh, south of town. This is actually Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Andy, who is, you know, who's kind of watching over the boys at this point. This is a picture from the Richardson Library at Townsend Center. And this actually was initiated by this gentleman. This is actually Harriet Bard's son, George. And after he left to go to Bloomington to, to work on his PhD, they can, you know, the library continued having this. And actually it was, it continued for very many years. So all of these other places. And then in 1965, they started a, what they called at that point, they called it a shut-in service. We called it later, we called it a homebound service. But this was something that, you know, um, they would simply take books out to people who couldn't make it in themselves. Um, I always like this picture because, you know, everything was very low tech. She's, they're writing everything down in a big old ledger. Um, the other the kind of interesting thing, they were intending to start this in February of 1965, but that is exactly the moment that Richmond had its big uh, telephone company fire. And since this was all telephone based, they pretty much, you know, Richmond didn't have telephone service for the next several months, essentially. So this service didn't actually start until November of 1965. And of course, 1966, they started the bookmobile. And of course that expanded immensely in, in years after that. But this is past the 100 years. I'm really not gonna go too much further. Um, I do want to end with this photo right here. This is 100 years. So this is a picture that was taken uh, at the centennial celebration of Morrison Reeves Library. And I love this one because it, it kind of illustrates a little bit of one of the other really um, significant things that Mrs. Barr did. Very early on, very soon after she came in, in the like 1947, 48, um, she wanted to have women of color on the staff. And this right here, this is Maxine Potter. And she was the first um, black woman that Mrs. Bard hired. And soon after was Emma Andy. And the two of them were there until they retired. And that sort of led to another thing that was common in Morrison Reeves of, of you know, of, well, what I say later years. Um, they were all very proper. Everybody was Mrs. Bard and, and Miss such and such and, and, you know, Mrs. Potter because, and as this is how, how Mrs. Bar, uh, Mrs. Bard said it, she said that there were women who had, would never think of calling me Harriet, but they had no problem calling Mrs. Potter Maxine. And so while they were in the library, everybody was Mrs. Potter and Mrs. Andy and Mrs. Bard and Mrs. Thorne. I don't remember any of the rest of the theirs, but I know this is Mrs. Thorne. So because I had to stop at 100 years, that's what I'm going to do.